Hi, my name is Jamie and I am a British adventure runner who has recently returned from a 17,000 kilometre run from Canada to Argentina. Jamie, how are you, brother? I'm very well. How are you? Thank you very much for having me on your YouTube. Oh, mate, I'll tell you what. One sec. I'm going to turn my, my light down because my face is like the, the sun. And I'm not the <laughs> messiah, everyone, I promise. <laughs> hey, no, I'm the one with the hair for that one. No, Jamie, listen, the thanks is all mine. Um, my life keeps throwing up little gems at me that, that, that I'm a both delighted for and surprised by. And one of them is you and, and your amazing life story. Um, for our friends at home, Jamie is just like your ultimate uh, adventure warrior in that beautiful <laughs> sense that, that, that most of us want to do and a lot of people will probably never make time for. I'm talking all the adventures you want, the cycling, the running, the, the global exploration. And the reason I say it was sort of unexpected is you get to hear of your sort of, um, is it Sean Conway? Yeah, the Sean Conways uh, of the world. He's, yeah, yeah I, I, I know Sean. He's a great guy. Yeah, I think we, me and Sean have had a bit of um, sort of banter together. But, you you know, you get to hear of these sort of what, what almost seem like one-off feats of amazing endurance. And then there's guys like you that, bloody hell, you you haven't stopped hit, hitting it, Jamie, have you? And, and I'm just surprised that our paths haven't crossed until now. Well, I think one of the big differences between some of the adventuring I do and some of the adventures that other people do is I don't pursue records or firsts or anything like that. So when it comes to like the wow factor of breaking a record or something, I, it's not something that interests me. So, you know, it, I just, I'm just a guy who does what I do because I love it and try to make a living out of it wherever I can so it's it's kind of it's quite a personal thing for me hence well hopefully that's why I'm just a little bit less in the limelight yes and and I don't mean to sound at all disrespectful for uh there I'm all for just get out live your life do the things you wanted to do as a kid add to your bucket list or whatever people want to call call that and do it because it's such a beautiful planet yeah and when you do these things you feel can i say like god without except upsetting anybody you know the thing is i just think it makes you feel alive because i don't know if, uh, i don't know about you but you know my life very clearly is was lived has been in two parts there was pre-adventure and then adventure and i just I existed before and now I feel alive and it's by doing these adventures that I feel alive I feel all the senses of the being out in the different environments and everything and uh go to places and experience things and meet people and all that kind of stuff which I never did in my old life I just jumped on a tube every day and sat in an office so do you find Jamie like, like me you can transfer that lovely feeling in, 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 in your mind and your body into, let's say, your ordinary life when you're not adventuring and, and really appreciate this existence? Yeah, I find that that's actually, it's, it's a big question and it's, it's a hard one to answer because, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, how do you day in, day out, do these adventures and you're like pushing yourself to the limit and um, it must be so difficult. You must really enjoy not when you get back and you're back at home and it's, it's the complete opposite. I, I struggle when I'm at home uh, and as much as I, I, I love what I've done and I can extract and remember and relive those experiences, 
I never feel like I'm living life to the full when I'm not on that adventure. So I kind of, this whole COVID lockdown thing has just been a, just continually feeling not down, but just like frustrated that I'm not able to live my life to the maximum that I like to. Yes, I've got you. I, do you know, my mind tends to go to that because obviously, you know, we like to, I, I was going to do the marathon of the sands this year. Yeah. So my mind is running, you know, whatever it is, 700 miles across a desert with all these wonderful people cooking yeah. up my food in a, you know, on, on a camping stove and just being in my absolute element. Right. Yeah. What, what I'm kind of learning to do is, is, is get, keep that feeling but when life is a bit shit <laughs> yeah 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 you know, which is a, which is a trick to be able to do that yeah i god I probably getting a bit 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 too deep already but <laughs> it's just that you know this universe it's so beautiful it 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 it, it is and the people that are wanting to do the things that you've done but they're working nine to five. They've done it since they left school. They got the next promotion is, you know, it's, it's going to be next year. And then we'll get the, you know, an extra bedroom on the house and we'll get the car. And, and it's, oh, gosh, this is not a criticism for anyone listening. Not, not whatsoever, because I've done that life, you know, and, and, and Jamie, it's, and I know you have too. Yeah. It's just to actually experience being free and living your dream and, and pushing your body beyond not just what you ever could have imagined, but what everyone will tell you, no, you can't do that. No, you'll yeah. die. You, 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 if you try and run 100 miles, you, you'll, you'll die. And, and to be out there doing that, it's, it, oh, wouldn't it be great well, if everybody thing, could do that? It's one of these things, I think, um, trying to put this into a nice little sound bite is difficult, but there is, so one of the things that have been kept in a single place and not being able to travel and not being able to push myself has made me, so I've always, people go, what are you running away from? And I'm like, I'm not running away from anything. I'm running towards stuff I'm, I'm experiencing. But when you actually stop and you're stuck in one place, you, you realize you do have character traits that why you, they kind of, and maybe you do go and do these adventures so you don't have to face up to living normal life um, because normal life is quite difficult and for some people. And I, I you know, the, the routines, the structures, the, the, the infrastructure in place to look to, we have to live within. I find that very difficult. And that's where I go out to these adventures and I'm, as you said, free to go and do everything. Um, but I, I, one of those things I've, I find people saying is like, oh, all these people are sitting in their houses and like the, what life I used to lead. You know, part of me is actually still jealous of some of those people because the people who can have a job and are passionate about their job and can have a family and kids and that kind of community, family community, I don't have that. So while I have all the freedom in the world to go and do whatever I want, whenever I want, I, I, it is a sacrifice of not having the other life. So there is, I think the perfect thing is the balance, is the people who can work in a, at a job that they love, in a career they love, but can still make time to go and do adventures. They're the people I think who are really nailing it. But. Hey, you just, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not being egocentric. I, it's just that, you know, fatherhood's a relatively new thing for me. And, and oh, thank you. I mean, I, my little boy's five years old now. He's, I feel like mother nature just, try to create the perfect partner and the perfect little boy and then just gave them to me and i'm so oh i don't know what i am really but what i will say it's a lovely kind of like cherry on the cake you know it's really been if i say tomorrow right i'm going to try and 
parachute off Mount Everest and then land on a plane that's going to take me to the South Pole, my girlfriend would be like, yeah, do it. <laughs> you know, and that's the great, great yeah. position I'm in, Jamie, you know, and, and fatherhood again was, it was something that I, I never shied away from it. Just, it never happened. I, I never yeah. met the right person. Um, I, I never put like all my cards on, right. When I'm a dad, that life will be great. I, I'm not that kind of person. You know, I just thought if it comes, it comes, if it doesn't life's still brilliant. Right. Okay. So I'm not good. I don't want to turn this around to me interviewing you or having, asking the questions, but so when you had a, a child, a little boy, does that change the risks you're willing to take when you're doing adventures? Oh, what a fantastic question. And feel free to ask me, me, me anything. Um, because obviously, you're like, when, when I've been in places, I've been like, what I'm about to embark on is incredibly selfish. If that, like, if I die, it's not going to affect me in any way whatsoever, but it is going to affect my mother and my sister and brothers and friends. They're the ones that are going to have to deal with my my decision to put myself in danger um but i guess that that is heightened when you have some people who are dependent on you it, what you say is just so absolutely true um i mean for example the reason i really got a grip on my drinking which you know i i make no bones of the fact i drank pretty much every day for 30 years right it was just what I did I was young single um obviously I wasn't free <laughs> so I was chained to alcohol and and all the other party stuff but the one thing that sobered me up was waking up on a on a bench in Paddington station at four o'clock in the morning where I was supposed to be going you know going to my accommodation and I'd drunkenly fallen asleep in public and anything could have happened to me, Jamie, you know, I could have been robbed, stabbed, you know, what, irregardless, it wasn't good behavior for someone who'd just become a father, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's times like that, that I'm able to kind of pull it out of the bag a bit and go, oi, come on, Chris, you know, you, you got a little boy and you think the world of him, he thinks the world of you, and I'm able to up, up my game a bit, right? What When it comes to the adventure side, it's, it's a slight unknown, Jamie, because I haven't done anything since I've had my son that I would call life-threatening. Whereas before I have, I mean, I've been, I've been robbed in the Amazon jungle. I've, uh, you know, my best friend died, drowned when we was on holiday and we were, let, let's just say, partying. And and uh, that's, you know, that's a serious thing to have your best mate dead on the beach in front of you. Yeah. Um, but as far as my adventures have been, it's been like running the length of the UK, okay? As long as you've got a phone and it's got a credit card tucked in it, then you're, there isn't, you know, and your compass says south. It, it's not a lot to go wrong, right? Unless yeah, you've got yeah. some under, underlying heart condition or something. Um, quadruple Ironman. Well, you just got to be able to make sure you can swim. That's, that's the issue there, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. today's modern wetsuits are so buoyant, to be honest, that's not that's not going to be your, your, your problem. Where it comes into my mind is it's always been a dream of mine to climb Everest. Um, I podcasted the other day with Nims Die, the Gurkha turned SBS um, legend, can we say, that's climbed 14 of the world's highest peaks in less than six months. And He's offered to train me. Oh, wow. Um, and at this point, yes, it is still an option on my bucket list, right? The question in my mind is, what if something went wrong? And then my little boy's got to go for the rest of his life 
as well. My daddy died when I was six, you know, or seven. Yeah. yeah. And I never, you know, I've got all these photos and video and I, I kind of just remember him, but not. A, and it's knowing because I've worked a lot in a social kind of psychological field that that is going to affect him for the rest of his life. Yeah. You know, yeah. drugs, alcohol, addiction, all the stuff that I've battled my whole life is suddenly it's going to be an issue. Po possibly. Yeah. Yeah. For, for him. Um, you look at Mount Everest and you think for every hundred people that reach the summit, X amount die. I don't exactly know what is because I reckon the statistics of how many people die is always like heightened a bit. I, 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 mm. it, I don't think it can be as dangerous as, as people say, but I'm not stupid. You know, it, it, it's, it, it can be a life and death situation. It can come on like that as, you know, oh, yeah. I'm preaching yeah, yeah. to the, the choir here so that would be a case of <sighs> really sit down and weigh up the odds you know you've got to live your life yeah you've got to, you've got to keep being you and, and smashing your dreams but is that unacceptable you know i saw Ant middleton climbed everest recently you know in the last year or so and he's got I think three children, if if not more more than that, Jamie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, gosh, I don't know if that answers your question. And sorry. No, it, does. no, it does very much so. Um, but I think that the, the answer to the question probably is it, it's a very difficult one because you're you're wrestling with two different loves: your loves for what you do and your love for a human being. So it's. Yeah, something I, I haven't had the ability to properly experience. So, yeah, I'd say three things I still would like to do is some sort of, po you know, I've, I've been fortunate to be on an Antarctic expedition to the polar circle and it was amazing. And having been in the military, so we've done all the skiing stuff up in the Arctic, I'd like to ski to the South Pole, if not, you know, even more. I'd love to row across, let's say, the Atlantic or a body of, of water. And I'd like to climb Everest. And of course, they're all three, they're three things that come with risk. And yeah. Yes. Now, I'd say that I, I'd love to do a polar expedition and love to, to uh, row across an ocean. Everest, I have to say, to be honest, I'm not that fussed about um, because. So many people do it just just to say they've got to the top. And I don't think that's the reason why you should climb a mountain. Mm. Personally. So now I climbed Aconcagua and Chimborazu. Um, and they're great experiences, but you know, I, I, I loved Aconcagua. I'd love to do more mountains like that. The kind of 7,000 meters, I think. Yes, and we're talking South America, aren't we? Yeah, uh, Argentina. Argentina, Aconcagua. Yeah, of course. Is that the highest mountain in South America? It's the highest mountain outside the Himalayas. Oh, wow. Yeah, I remember when I was backpacking in South America, and that was quite, quite a, like a big thing. It came up a lot. You, there were a lot of, um, like, uh, adventure companies that were you you could go to and they'd provide kit and stuff not not taken away the fact that it sounds bloody difficult yeah well i didn't i yeah i didn't do it that way so yeah it's normally i think it's about three and a half four thousand pounds um to be taken up the mountain wow i my friend and i we just we did it ourselves we yeah more a more fun way of doing it a more rewarding way of doing it um so did that cost you a lot of money to organize it yourselves? Um, well, you have to pay $900 to get your permit to get in there, $500 to get a mule to take your stuff up and down from base camp. And then on top of that, it's lights, kit, and food. So 
once you've got over the kind of it's going to cost me it's going to cost me two thousand dollars so 15 1600 quid plus kit yeah it's a, it's a lot it's a lot cheaper than sixty thousand pounds to climb everest yeah my everything's a bit funny because obviously i'm that generation that we grew up with everest exploration yeah you know from edmund hillary through chris bonnington for all i mean i i was showing nims the books i've, I've got like 10 books i can see from here that that are all about Ev and yet i'd still be the first to hold my hand up and say i'm not necessarily interested in mountain climbing per se simply because i'm rushed off my feet with my life you know i, I haven't got any more time to have another hobby or whatever but just the you know, I think it's possible to have a bucket list item, but you're still doing it for the experience, right? Do you... Oh, yeah, no, very much. So. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. 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 But other than that, I, I get it. You know, if you're some rich yank or whatever, and you, you, you're you a top dentist or lawyer or something, and £40,000 expedition fee is nothing to you, and you just want to say you've been up Everest and you yeah. don't, like look that way or look that way while you're doing it. I mean, some of these guys, when they see a dead body, they're all freaked out. It, it, it's almost like, you haven't really thought this through, have you? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what did you think climbing this mountain was going to be? Yeah. So there's so there's probably like a million things I'd love to ask you, Jamie, you know, and I'm, I'm obviously conscious of our time. Um, how are you from a fitness? I mean, you've run 17,000 kilometers, which is what about 10,000 miles from Vancouver to, was it Argentina? Yeah. To Buenos Aires. Yeah. yeah. Buenos Aires. Um, so basically from the North American continent through Central America into South America. Yeah. That is beholden, if that's the right word, with so many challenges and planning and, and what ifs and how to get from A to D by going through Z. But I know that because I backpack in every single country in the, the Americas. So and just backpacking throws a few challenges and uh, yeah, that, I'd actually from a logistical point of view I'd say running is easier than backpacking um, because everything you have is in your stroller in front of you you can only go where that stroller goes you can't take public transport you can't do anything else so and you just have to get out so you're basically just every day you're you're you wake up in the morning you have to run a certain amount you have to eat a certain amount and you have to find somewhere safe to camp or sleep at the end of the night, the day. And once you've done that a few times, it is just, you have to get into the mentality that you just, it's a re repetition because when I was in the USA, you'd be going up a hill and it'd be 400 meters high or 900 meters high. And you're like, this is the biggest thing in the world. And you just have to, you've got to train yourself not to be phased by anything because that, if you can't, if you're complaining about that hill, when you're running across the Andes in um, Chile at 4,830 meters, which is the same height as Mont Blanc, and you're running 60K a day up at 4,800 meters, you know, you, you can't, you, you're, you have to, you're not, you can't allow things like that to phase you. Um, and uh, yeah, actually what you find is you spend your whole time thinking about, I've got to run over the Andes. And you worry yourself so much and you prep and prep and prep as you're going. But by the time you get there, you're actually really looking forward to the new challenge because you've got so bored, like running across the Atacama Desert. It's kind of easy uh, having done 12,000 kilometers. So um, in, in the Atacama, did you get the the um, National Park guards come and challenge you a lot? Or come no, because I was going down the road. So I was all right. Ah, uh, OK. Yeah. I camped there a few nights in the Atacama and 
almost like on cue, first night of camping, the lights come on, the car, you know, some Jeep approaches, what are you doing? And I think you were allowed to camp for one night or something. It wasn't, it wasn't like a problem. I think that's like national parks the world over. You can camp one night, um, but there's always someone to ruin, ruin your paradise. Uh, no, I've actually, I was, see, I was very lucky that all the people that everyone said would ruin my journey, like the Mexican police and the armies and the, they were the nicest people. I was like, I was bought meals by the police. I was given escorts by the police. Um, they would tell me to run on the motorway because it was safer than these roads. And you know, like all the authority figures that everyone is so scared of were the people who did their job. They looked out for me and made sure that I was in the safest environment I could be in to continue what I was doing. So, so when you're facing these hills, or mount, mountains, I should say, I found a really th weird thing. When I ran the length of the UK, and I'm not like a fit guy, I'm like, if you talk to me about calories and splits and sprints and stuff, I, I don't do any of that. In fact, I didn't do any training to run the length of the UK. I, I, I'd been disabled with a back condition, right? So I just put my Bergen on, flew to John O'Groats, and then just started running, right? But what I noticed is, especially in Wales, where some of the hills were like 18 miles straight up or it might have been 18 kilometers, I could just run them. I just head down, little steps. Yeah. Whereas when I was an 18 year old Marine, if you'd put me on the same hill, I'd have been hanging out my backside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably something that comes a little bit with age as well, because when you're younger, you want to be fast, you want to be first, you want to be quickest, you need to be the strongest. Um, you care more about what people around you will be thinking about what you're doing. And I think like I, when I was doing my run, I was 34. Um, and I think through all the different things I've done, I realized no one cares about what you're doing, apart from you and a couple of others. Like, you kind of sit there going, I've got to keep going at this speed because people will think less of me. And then you realize that everyone else is just dealing with their own lives and you're, they'll check in on you every once in a while. But, and then when you realize that no one cares, you're like, oh, so I'm free just to do this at my speed, how I want. And then suddenly that gives you this new strength to actually push yourself harder, just concentrating on what you're doing. Um, so I don't know if that, because... When I was running the Americas, I started off running 30 kilometers a day, 40 kilometers a day, having a rest day every five days or something. And then the last 28 days, I averaged like 58 kilometers a day, um, partly because I told my girlfriend I would be in um, Buenos Aires for New Year's Eve. And I was kind of like, I do not want to piss her off. So um, push myself pretty hard. But um, my body didn't didn't react as badly as it did at the beginning. So I think we become, we grow, I think, as we get older. Yes. And I think that's why endurance, lots of endurance people are older. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I set myself this goal that I wanted to average an ultramarathon a day. And as you know, an ultramarathon is anything over 26.2 miles. So I wasn't, I wasn't going to get like hung up on, how far over that I ran. I just wanted to get that, claim that moniker that it was an ultra, you know, it might be 22.3 one day, but, or, or, or as an average overall. But like you say, the fact that people weren't taking that seriously, they were just amazed I was running the length of the country. Yeah. And to me- Which is, which is amazing. Yeah. And I said that, I said, anybody doing this deserves, you know, full credit you know live your dreams if you want to walk it great if you want to do it you know um my friend Stuart Stuart Kettle did it in a bathtub right he cycle he put some wheels on a bathtub and cycled it right but my goal was this ultra marathon a day and when everyone kept like attacking that and going oh just walk oh just go and get a hotel go to hot go to the hot I was getting really Stop trying to ruin my dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is my goal. I'm putting effort in here. You know, ah, it's a bit silly, but people would like message me or, or post on social media. 
what bike are you on? I'm like, I'm 26 days into running the length of the car. How did you, you've been with me from the start. How did you think I was on a bike? Yeah. <laughs> Other people. Yeah. What, I love all these misconceptions. Like when I've had people go, so like you go to an event or something and go, and we have Jamie Ramsey who walked the length of the Americas. And you're like, I didn't, I ran it. <laughs> it went a lot quicker than walking. Um, but I've learned to just mm. it's like, yeah, you let so, it slide. Jamie, how is it with the stroller? So for, for our friends at home, this is like, can we say baby buggy? Is that the sort it's of- an absolutely unmodified baby buggy. Yeah. Um, so first up, I would say, so actually the baby buggy helps quite a lot for like, you can slightly lean on it. So it does help a little bit that way. It also, it keeps rolling. So it kind of pulls you along a bit. Like that, not that that makes it easier, but it keeps your momentum up. It's less, the problem is it's got no brakes. So every time you're going downhill, you are using your whole body and legs to, to maintain. And when you're like up in the Andes, it's 50 kilos. So you've got 50 kilos on wheels running away from you and you're trying to hold that back. So it is, it is difficult, but God, if I went back and did it now, the amount of weight I had in that stroller was purely from naivety. Like I'd never done an, an adventure like this before. So I just chucked in everything. Um, if I did it now, it'd be this tiny little stroller that would be a lot more manageable, but I love my stroller still upstairs. You know, just just in case a little little one comes along one day and I need to, to take them to school or something. It's so funny that you say that because this is important to guys like me and you to, to the public public. No, no, I mean, there's no disrespect. They're like, who, who cares about weight or did it? They just see you doing the event. I rocked up at John and Groats with a 16 kilogram backpack, right? Yeah, as heavy as what we'd carry in the Marines. It, 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 it didn't bother me. It was fine. I, I just trotted along fine with it. Right. But I soon realized it's going to do my body in. If I keep oh, yeah. carrying this weight, something is going to give. So I gradually got rid of the weight. I went to a post office and I, I'd send a kilo of stuff home, like my book that I didn't need. Yeah. Um, I've got six pairs of socks, only really need two. So four pairs would just go in the waste bin or something, right? Did you do the same as me? Like every, like nearly every adventure I do every night, I'm like, unpack my bag and like, do I really need this? And I just go through and I just repack my bag every day. There was nothing I regretted ditching. I miss my book. You know, I, I like to read a paperback. I, I've got Obviously, my phone, you can read stuff on Kindle yeah. on your phone. There was a couple of times I thought, oh, I could just lie in my tent now and re read and, reading a book. But there was, a, you know, there was, I had audio books and stuff. I think my gloves, when I was running through the Scottish Highlands and it was almost zero degrees at night and it was torrential rain, a lot of it, I thought maybe I could do my gloves. <laughs> but other than that, no. No, you're 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 completely right. But I did think when I've seen people run across, say, America, and they've got the stroller, your mind as an adventure just thinks, I wonder what that would be like. Yeah, well, I've, I've had I've had the luck to do both because I when I ran the Three Peaks in the UK and the Scottish Isles, I did that with the backpack on, and the the you know both are punishing in their own ways. Both have come with their own limitations. But the backpack really does allow you to do trail running. Um, when you've got a baby stroller, you are stuck to concrete, pretty much. You're on tarmac the whole time, uh, which obviously puts a little bit of strain on your body. Um, but and, and it restricts you. But having that backpack gives you the freedom just to go crazy. Which, mm. uh, so on your big American trip, then, what or... or america's trip i should say what what kind of equipment are you taking and why are you taking it um running the, i find actually a lot of people talk about all these different types of adventures and what kind of kit it's very 
I think you can have a very standardized kit, which will do you for hiking, running, cycle touring. You know, you want a lightweight, small tent. Um, and as, as, you've, as I've done more, you realize what you need. So you need a lightweight, small tent that stands without needing tent pegs. So you can sleep anywhere because if you're dependent on having te your tent pegged, then you're limiting where you can sleep. Uh, so I always I love the MSR Hubba Hubba NX, you know, and I don't mind taking extra weight because I'm, I'm slightly bigger. So I take a two person tent. So I've got space to move around at night, um, especially if it's raining. Um, and then you want to have a good cooker. And I only ever have the small, the smallest cooker I can. Because all I do is boil water. I never cook proper food in the thing. Uh, I'll buy whatever I need when I can. And then I'll do porridge, coffee, and then heat up um, a dehydrated meal or noodles or something like that. Um, and then there's not really that much. A good sleeping bag and a good sleeping mat. I'm a big believer in you actually spend more time in your tent sleeping than you do running or whatever so you should probably make sure that that part of your day is more comfortable because if you've got that bit right you will perform better the next day so i i don't mind taking the extra weight and then as many snickers bars as i can take i got the um thermalite ultralight i think it's called thermarest ultralight yeah the neo air ultralight my god it weighs something silly like hundred and I don't even think it weighs 175 grams but it's it's yeah you know it, it it's less le less than that right yes yeah, uh, they make some amazing stuff I've got the neo air and obviously I now want the ultralight but when you've paid 150 for the neo air you can't justify yeah that's the thing and of course it's punctures isn't it it the the yeah, if you use um, uh, McNett Tenacious Tape. Oh, that eight works. Pans, eight pans, Cotswold Outdoor, just comes in a roll, cut a hole, cut it, cut it in a circle, stick it on. I've got five on my, my one at the moment. Oh, wow. What's it called? I'm going to write that down. McNett Tenacious Tape or Tenacity Tape, one or the other. I think it's Tenacious. Um, and it's uh, a lot better than the, the repair kit that comes with it. Yeah. Oh, Good tip. <laughs> yeah. It can be used for your tent, your jackets. I've got I've got that stuff all over all my stuff. How did you deal then? Because in the Americas, so we're talking Central America down, yeah. food can be really cheap. I mean, I remember being in Bolivia and ordinarily I'd cook with my camping stove just to make my travels as cheap as possible. And I'd buy food from the market I lived for, for less than $5 a day for um, 18 months of traveling. And six months of that was in Asia. So I, yeah, and I did skydiving and scuba diving and all this sort of stuff. But I did it because I didn't just do the typical tourist thing, which is go into a restaurant and pay 20 quid for a meal or whatever, or, or in Bolivia, 10 quid. Um, sorry, or in South America, 10 quid. But in Bolivia, you could get a three course meal for like 70 P <laughs> it's ridiculous. Some of the places. I'm, I'm almost something saying 17 P in my head. This was like 15 years ago now, but, but of course with eating the local cuisine, you risk getting a stomach bug, right? I would say that you, if you occasionally eat the, local cuisine then you risk getting a stomach bug but if you just jump in and do it every day you're actually your body gets pretty used to it and I think it builds up a bit of a, a tolerance to some of the things that your body might react to normally I I think water is more of a risk than food in these places so most of the food they cook the absolute hell out of it and it's the meat is as tough as leather um and the vegetables have got no nutrients left in them but um it's the water i think is where i had more problems from getting giardia in in panama and colombia um and that's hard to when you're running like some days i think i was going to lose 
five, 10 times a day and you, you just can't eat. I ran 40, I ran a marathon across a desert and I couldn't eat or drink anything for the whole day. So you're in the middle of a desert sweating, you can't eat your body and you're trying to push. And that, you know, it's coming from bad water, so. How did you get rid of the giardia? Because I, I caught that in, um, just looking at my map up here, I, th I think it was Ecuador. And yeah. oh my God, within about two hours of drinking this water, and it wasn't the low, and then normally the water supplies are fine. It's when, when it's a holding tank on the roof of a hostel or something, you don't realize it's coming from the roof and you're in your room and you swivel the tap. And, and it was only when I looked at this water in, in the light, oh my God, it's, it's, there's floaters in there. Right? Yeah. And within two hours, your stomach is gurgling. And I, ironically, that lasted with me uh, about two years that bad stomach I yeah it really I, sticks with you ah oh, i think i killed the parasite with with um antibiotics but along those antibiotics were so strong they killed everything else in my stomach so then i had a bad stomach for two years and i still thought it was the giardia right yeah um so yes i i can empathize <laughs> yeah and it's weird because when you go to um when you're in the uk or france and you're saying right okay can i i think i've got giardia and you read them this you tell them your symptoms they go yeah you've got giardia i'm trying to get the medicines complete ball like go to colombia and you walk into a pharmacy and you're like i think i've got giardia and the, the lady or the guy just lifts puts the hand right next to the pill the pill and just hands you medicine you're like okay so this is you get this one a lot um and it costs nothing and you take your pills but God, I had some horrible nights in my tent with Giardia. Oh. It's, Jamie, it, it is, to what people would believe, the human body is a lot more resilient, isn't it? That, as, as you've just stated, than what we would think. Oh, and yeah, the body, the body will go further. Your body will go longer than your mind will. So it'll be your mind that tells you to stop before your body tells you to stop. I find in most cases, um, and then, you know, you just have to train yourself to, to be able to tell your mind that you can actually carry on and then you carry on. And I think there's quite all the times I had the kind of days where I didn't feel like I could carry on and I, my body was spent and I was, I'd sit down on the side of the road, um, I always realized there was a way of, there's always, you, there's some sort of positivity that will happen during that day, which will change your frame of mind. And once your frame of mind has been changed by someone stopping and giving you a sandwich or um, just even someone sending you a message, um, that will change your mindset. And then as soon as that's changed, your your mental kind of ability to push on goes and your, and your physical and then suddenly you can end up struggling at seven kilometers and then you smash out 60 by the end of the day uh, feeling great so it's just learning how to play tricks on your mind or your body it, which is what, what allows you to keep going um, and that's what, something I'm really worried about at the moment because you know after 2019 in 2019 I climbed Aconcagua, hiked across Utah, ran across Iceland and cycled across Australia um, and now 2020, I had a massive adventure planned, uh, which I can't talk about because it's hopefully going to happen next year. Um, but I, I was already, my body, I, I, my body was used to being tired and being tricked to go further and push, push, push. I've now had a year of sitting on my ass and I've got to, I'm really worried. Like, oh my God, I think I've got soft. I think, I think my body is going to have, I'm going to have to reteach my body. Um, which is going to be, it'll be interesting because when I was 34, it was easy to teach your body to do this stuff. I'm going to be 41 next time I do it. And it's, going to be, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how I, how I react. It's almost like you're reading the thoughts in my mind, mate, because in two weeks or well, three weeks time, I'm going to run 200 miles nonstop. Wow. Yeah. Well, I say nonstop, you know, uh, that because Killian Journey just did the 24 hour. Have you seen that? No, what did he do? He ran, there was a competition or something. I, I never saw the result, but they ran for 24 hours. 
and to ah. see who could, run the, who could run the furthest in 24 hours. And I bet they probably, what, did 150 miles? I don't know what that is in kilometres. Well, I do, but... I don't know. I, I know. I, I honestly don't know what, what, what they reach, but yeah. But 200 miles, that'll be a... Oh, that'll be hard. Well... What, what, are you doing it on roads or trails or a machine? No, here's, here, here's my, my, my rough plan. And for anyone listening, you're not allowed to hold me to this. It's a plan at the minute. But I like to try and do something for charity. If I, if I can angle it for a veterans charity, um, then obviously that... that I, I, I know a lot of veterans is what I'm trying to yeah. say. So that, I'm on a good, good start. So my plan and it's inspired by a, a very lovely friend of mine called James English who's got massively pop, popular podcast in the UK and Jamesy did a documentary called uh, Homeless for Christmas where he spent seven days over Christmas living with the homeless population up in I think it was Glasgow a very heart-wrenching um, documentary and it got me thinking and I thought what about if I did an event called Running Home Less for Christmas? So running home for Christmas, but running homeless for Christmas, where I give up my Christmas to run, um, well, to run home, let's say, right? And obviously the theme is that I'm homeless because I'm running home. And... I don't know how I came up with the idea, Jamie, but I thought, let's ask my local running track if they'll let me run around there. I, it's something to do with the fact that 200 miles, if you're doing it on normal terrain, it's probably not going to happen. It, it, it's, it, that is going to be really, really hard. But a mundane repeat around a track where it's dead flat, it's a good surface. You can have your refreshment and your nutrition as and lit, literally as and when with someone running up, giving it to you. You've got your car over there. So if you get a shiver on, you can just hop in the car and put the heater on or grab your jacket or pull the ice bath out the back and have a quick ice. What, what? I just thought, that would probably make it easier to run 200 miles in two days if, if, you've, if you do it in that sort of environment. But then, of course, it makes it a real mental challenge to keep running. You oh, know, yeah, yeah, that would be really difficult. It's one thing to run when you've got beautiful surroundings and a different person popping up all the time or whatever. So, yeah, that's... Sorry. I, 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 I always, I've always thought that the, the closer to home your adventure, the, the harder it is to keep going. So yeah. running the Americas, like if you're in the middle of the Atacama Desert and you're thinking, oh, I don't fancy this anymore. You can't just go home. You have to carry on. There's no choice. You have to carry on. Because, but if you're running around the UK or the length of the UK or whatever, you can, it's a lot easier to say, oh, I can't bother with this, I'm just going to go home. Mm -hmm. And you have to overcome that and keep going. So I always think all the people who are doing stuff in the UK, when they live in the UK, doing this long distance stuff, it's actually a really, really bizarrely quite complex to kind of keep going because home is just, it's so accessible, it's just there. So doing it around a track, oh, your local track, that would be like, that would be hard, hard. Well, I wanted it to be hard. Um, I'm a bit mental, really, because I don't get that thing about wanting to give up. I, I'm like the opposite. I don't I don't want to fail. Yeah. Which puts me in a bloody rubbish position <laughs> because I will push myself way beyond what I don't want to say what I probably should. Because I, I'm a great believer you can push the human body as much as possible. And, and as long as you eat the right diet and, you know, think, think the right things, you, you just recover. I, I don't think you can, like, damage your body by running it hard. Uh, no, I think your body will stop you if it needs to stop you. Yeah. 
your, your body will have the, 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 the you run and you'll notice you'll run and it gets hard and you can push through that and keep running but if you have something mechanical or internal going wrong your body will shut down and you will not be able to carry on it's not a choice that you'll be able to make your body will stop you um, yeah and we're not going to get to that we're not going to get that far <laughs> <laughs> Your, your body has it has systems in place to 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 stop you. So. Mm. What about running shoes then? Because when I ran from John O'Groats to Lands End, I got I got through five pairs of shoes. I literally wore I wore through them. What what do you do about that when you're you're in the middle of the jungle? So I got I got through seventeen pairs of shoes on uh, running the Americas. So basically, one every thousand kilometers. Um, I started off with just the old pair of trainers I'd be running at home with, and then I kind of bought them as I went. And then, you know, as these things pick up a bit of um, traction, um, Nike sent me sent me a whole bunch of trainers to Mexico. And then when I got to South America, Adidas sent me nine pairs of trainers that my mum would then post to Quito and then to Lima, and I'd pick up these care packages. But my mother had like got some local delicacies from home and then freeze uh, kind of vacuum pack them and stuck them inside the um the shoes so when you're opening up these shoes you'd be like oh wow pate um and oh some um gherkins <laughs> that mum's made at home or that kind of thing so mm. these little care packages came little things i look forward to but running shoes is weird because i don't i've never had one pair of running shoes that works for me the whole time I kind of find that I'll run with one. I love them. And then suddenly one day they just don't work anymore. And then I have to find another pair of running shoes. And I'm really into my hookers at the moment or hookers or whatever people call them. Um, Once again, you take the thought out of my head, Jamie. I was just going to ask you, what, what do you think of this trend? And yesterday I ran 11 miles. It's unusual for me. I don't really like run distance. I normally run around the block, but because of this 200 miler I've been running out to my dad's place and he lives 11 miles away right and then my girlfriend picks me up but yesterday I ran it in 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 a pair of hokers hokers yeah. hoker one whatever they're called which ones um these ones are called the, trail uh, on road. the name escapes me but they're road trainers and they're the ones with the fattest sole. Right. I've got the Cliftons. Yeah. For, for our friends listening, Hoka are a relatively new brand on the market. And they've completely gone against what was a trend about one, two, three to sort of five years ago of, of minimal shoes, like running as natural as you can be. So you've got people running barefoot, which which I've which I've done and, it, and it's an amazing experience. You've got people running with flat shoes. You've got people running with minimal cushioning. And the idea being your body it, it is as um, kind of in tune with its natural, natural state as possible. But then Hoka came along and went, no, sod all that big fat cushioned, um, bases of the shoes basically the foamy bit at the bottom and for us older runners especially people like myself who've had back problems they actually yeah when you stamp down on a hoka it's a lot less shock yeah going through your body right so it suddenly becomes like a yeah that could be the way to go my issue yesterday is i i ran this 11 miles and I was worried, Jamie, they were so spongy. I was worried if I was losing like kinetic energy through that sponginess. Um, and it was actually making me more tired to run in these soft shoes than if I just run in my normal pair of trainers. Well, I suppose it depends what kind of degree of, if you've gone right to the biggest ones, then maybe that, that might be the case. The Cliftons I've got, I don't feel that much difference from running um in my other shoes uh but i did come from ultra boost um the adidas ones which are quite spongy 
Um, but I really found it on the trails when I was running the Transalpine run back in 2018. I did it in the Mafate Evos and I just felt that my legs didn't get tired. They didn't have that jarring every day, all day that shook the muscles. And I think I, I just felt like I was running on air the whole time. And it really did help with my kind of recovery. So it allowed me to get up every day feeling fresher um, and be able to push on. I'm not someone who goes quickly. I'm someone who kind of goes medium speed, but hopefully can do that day in, day out. Uh, but having said that, I'm injured at the moment. But um, that's what I want to get back to. What's your injury at the moment, just out of interest? No idea. I've got there's something with my left ankle, Achilles heel. That whole area is kind of... Uh, I can play tennis, I can box, I can skip. Uh, but if I run, it's just causing some sort of, and I think it's something probably up with the glutes or in the hamstrings or the IT band. So I've just got my vibrating foam roller back. Um, so I'm gonna start just sitting on that uh, and try and work the muscles a bit. And then just, my, my problem is that I won't run because I'm injured, I won't run for a month. And then I'll go, oh, I'm better now. And I'll nail a kind of, 40 minute 10k trail run and then unsurprisingly the next day I'm injured again so I'm really going to try and take it right back do the two kilometers the three kilometers and build up slowly stay on roads first and then build up onto to trails as I go yeah but my, my adventure for next year will is going to be hopefully cycling related so I don't want to put too much pressure on my running at the moment um, if it needs rest, it's done over 20,000 kilometers of adventure running. That's not including any of my training. Um, so there's probably about 30,000 kilometers of running gone through my body. So if it needs a year off, I can have a year off. Yes, injuries, isn't it? That's a funny thing again. Yeah. But you've, you've had your, you had a spinal one, didn't you? Yeah, I popped a disc when I was training to run the length of the country and oh, it, it, it's actually for anyone listening that ha I haven't promoted it to. It's all in my latest book. Da -na -na -na. Nice plug. Yeah, state <laughs> of mind. There we go. I didn't intend to plug this, Jamie, but since we're talking about it, um, state of mind how I ran 36 ultra marathons back to back with no training. Um, and I did no training because I come from disability, as in my back was absolutely screwed. I'd never experienced such agony. I couldn't get out of bed for the best part of six months, if not a year. I had to wait and wait and wait for surgery. Um, I'm not like a surgery type of guy. I believe in, in finding a natural route to these things, but it wouldn't get, I mean, you can only lie in bed for so many months before your life is just yeah. passing you by, right? And the surgery was a literally a quick fix. Um, but other than that, injury-wise, I found I can run through most of them, you know? Whereas before, when I was young, if you got a little sprain or a this, stop running, recover, go on the websites, panic. How do I, you know, who else is it going through what I'm going through? When I ran the length of the UK, you, you, you haven't got that luxury. You just got to keep going. Yeah. You know, if you want to run an ultramarathon a day, you've obviously got to keep, keep, keep going. Um, so I've got, I've had a clicking ankle for, I don't even know when it started clicking 30 years ago, probably. And that gives me pain the more I run, but I can just run through it. I had Achilles tendonitis in the Marines during my commando tests. Um, it was from the leather on the back of my boot that had got hard and dried and it had formed this kink, which was pushing into the tendon. And just that slight push every time you, you know, put your foot down had yeah. ruptured, ruptured the tendon. Um, so in that case, I just cut the back of the boot out. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like boot sandals. Um, what else? When I ran the country, I just 
massive pain in my knee to the point where I I was wondering if it was going to make me have to give up. It was so bad. And it turned out not to be structural at all. It was just a nerve under under the skin of my um is it the patella, the front of your knee? Just just it was some sort of nerve thing that that where the skin was rubbing against the bone, the nerve was getting inflamed. So it wasn't a structural thing. And once I knew it wasn't structural, I didn't care about the pain. I just knew I'm not going to break my, yeah. my yeah. knee. I got a shin splint halfway down the country. So I fractured my right leg. Um, and that was a horrible moment because, as I said earlier, my mind isn't thinking, should I give up? My mind's thinking, how, how do I continue? Um, it's in my book. Rum comes into the equation, folks. I'm just going to state that here and now. But yeah, a tot of rum really, really, really helped me at that point. And I ran the rest of the thing with a fractured leg. Um, but yeah, you've got to feel for people with injuries, haven't you? If it, if, yeah. if it screws up the thing that you love. You know, that's that's big enough in it. So you can put, a, you know, plant surface fasciitis or whatever it's called plant that can put a plant runner out. Fasciitis. Yeah, that can put a runner out for two years. Right. Doing what they love. If you get that on a challenge that you you've spent thousands of pounds of money on and everyone's invested in you and you've got some charity stuff going on. Yeah. So got to hope that doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> yeah, I hope your injury get gets gets. Yeah, better. well, look, luckily I, I I can do other things, so I I can cycle, um, and I've just bought some ski touring skis, so I can head up to the Pyrenees when when we're allowed out of our houses properly, which is not for another two weeks. So uh, yes, um, but there's no snow, so hopefully in the next two weeks, if it could just snow, um, that would be lovely. What kind of skiing do you do? Uh, I'm going to start doing. I'm going to start doing ski touring, so skinning up the mountains and then and then skiing down. And I've got a couple of friends. One one who lives nearby and one in the in the Alps. Um, and they they both do ski touring, so um, they're going to be my coaches. So the skis skis boots and skins are all turning up, and then it's a whole new world. Oh, it's a beautiful sport. Have you done it? Well, you have to in, in the Marines, you've got to learn to cross country ski, right? Yeah. In Norway, I think they call it La Langlauf. Um, and so I've lived in Norway on and off for about, I think for about four years. And when you're up in the mountains, so in the northern part of Norway, or, or if you divide Norway across the middle, anywhere above there, it's all skiing territory and every weekend uh, a tractor will go out or some kind of snowmobile and it, and it cuts tracks in. Yeah. It will put them all around the local area for the local people. And so that weekend, you just put your skis on your, your, your boots, which are nothing like um, downhill boots, obviously, or, or certainly nothing like snowboard boots and you wax up your skis with the right wax depending on on the temperature or what your what your ability or what you want to achieve and you you got two things you can do you can either go in the tracks and they're like little uh they're perfect you know they're they're if you go out early morning they're all icy these tracks from from the frost and you can go so fast you know you go and you, and then you get to a downhill and you you tuck in and into the egg and you you just got to kind of hold on tight and stay in those tracks and it, oh Jamie it's just so brilliant it's so it's such a great sport and then of course wow. you can go you can go um, off the tracks which is cross country and a lot of it is like you're stepping in deep snow but then you you know you get to a bit it's a bit pisted and and you can ski down it but it's it's a wonderful sport 
and when you see it on the the Olympics and stuff, yeah, and that's you impressive. really can appreciate the 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 uh, professionalism of these Norwegians and Swedes and the Swiss and the Austrians and all these and the the you know the Czechs. Um, Central European countries that that they've done this since birth. You know they've yeah. been on skis since they were like three years old. Not that's not birth, is it? But <laughs> 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 right. And you get it. You get why this country wants to be the best at this, and this yeah. country. But they are bloody good at it. It it too. It's yeah. I'm just happy to have had like a small. A yeah. small experience in that area. Yeah, I'm just hoping, hoping that we get some snow before I depart on my next adventure. So, and then of course, sorry, I, just to add to that, you've got Telemark. Yeah, is is the Telemark is a type of ski, and it's also a type of turn that you do on a ski, which is very graceful, and it goes back to the ye olde times where people had to get around on skis and that's just a whole nother thing again then you get skins which which you mentioned jamie which mean you can actually ski up uphill it's uh yeah that's what i'm doing yeah it's a, it's a great area you can ski up on your skins take your skins off and then ski down the boots now you can clip them in at the heels so you can actually like downhill ski yeah. yes gosh what do you do fitness wise mate what 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 do you do you know do you have like a training program do you just do it for fun do you do you count calories do you have a diet um i definitely don't have a diet should have a diet uh, i do try to eat healthily so i i at the my diet and my training and everything changes quite a lot so at the moment i'm up at seven in the morning i'll do yoga um straight up I'll do half an hour, 40 minutes of yoga uh, before breakfast. On a normal day, I'll then go for, because I can't run at the moment, I'll do something like a, an eight, nine kilometer walk um, and then come back. And then I like to do, I'm getting quite into skipping at the moment with heavy, heavy rope skipping um, and boxing and cycling. So I'll try and do... I like, if I can, to do at least 15, 1,600 calories of exercise per day. Um, so that normally takes about three hours, four hours. Um, like after this, I went cycling this morning. I did yoga this morning. I'm going to do some skipping this afternoon, and then I'm going to go uh, for a walk this evening. So that'll be my day. And then during the, I'll, I'll eat. I have muesli for breakfast, and then at lunch I'll have soup or something and then in the evening i'll have meat and two veg mm. and probably a glass of wine jamie when you've been on your travels what i'll ask you two things what was the worst moment mentally where you felt at your lowest that you you had to push through and also what was the most dangerous situation you've been in Well, the most dangerous one, uh, I think, probably was when I was trekking across Mongolia. I don't know, you come across Carl Bushby? Name rings a bell, but... You, you'd like Carl Bushby. Look up Carl Bushby. Look up Carl Bushby, Bering Strait. Um, he is the first man with, with the guy he did it with. They were the first two to cross uh, from America to Russia across the Bering Strait on foot. Wow um uh basically by walking across ice floats and then jumping into the freezing water swimming to the next one pulling a thing on the a trailer uh it's it's insane uh, anyway i joined him in mongolia for uh, two months of camel trekking and actually it was with the animals is when the most dangerous stuff because that's what you can't control when you're running when you're cycling when you're mountaineering you can control pretty much everything. You know, weather comes in and stuff, but if you have the right equipment and you have the right skills, you can pretty much control. But when you've got animals that suddenly stampede, 
and you're standing in the middle and then suddenly 10 camels in a line all suddenly go out sideways and then all start running towards you you have to run very very quickly uh, or it, well, there were times where they were like get would get stuck in the snow and they're, they're tied together you'd have to dive in with all the feet going and you'd have to try and cut the ropes so they'd free up so they didn't get injured and so in danger wise that's probably the most dangerous stuff i've done and it's you're in minus 23 degrees uh, in the middle of nowhere, things go wrong. You're not going to be jumping into a hospital anytime soon. So it's kind of dangerous stuff there. Uh, in terms of low mental side, there's been, I've never really had a like catastrophic moment of doubt when I've been on an adventure. You know, I choose these adventures because I want to do them. I know there's going to be times that are going to be tough. And, and I know that I have the physical ability to get through it. And what I, and what I tell people is whenever things get tough, whenever things get hard, I, I quite honestly sit down on the side of the road or wherever I am. And I think you made a conscious decision to be here. Before you were here, you used to work in an office. Now, if you don't want to be where you are right now, facing the problem that's ahead of you, the option is that you go back to that world that you didn't want to be in before, because that's the only other option you've got. So you either tough it out here, find a solution and get on with it or you quit and go back to the life that you didn't enjoy before. And that is enough to just my, just to basically shake sense into myself and make me get back into the mindset I need to, to push on. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I think we all have our way of uh, rationalizing that with yeah. ourselves, don't we? Um, it's not really an option, is it? Come back to the office. <laughs> Sorry to everyone who works in an office. If you love it, I'm I'm envious of you. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 you. It's all about decisions, and you live with your decisions. And everything in life, I think every every decision in life will come with benefits, and you'll lose certain things. So I now I made a choice to live in the southwest of France, and it's great. I love it, but you lose the social element um not that many people to pop out and have lunch with around here i'm in the kind of middle of nowhere most of my friends are a lot older than i am nearly double my age some of them um so you kind of you lose so when i made the decision not to work in an office i made a decision to be in hardship and that's what you live with it and you have to you either embrace it or you complain about it and i like to embrace it Jamie, how have you found sponsorship? Um, it, it's something that sounds great and you'd think all adventurers, explorers, endurance athletes, whatever, you've got all this sponsorship thrown at them, but I've never had that. <laughs> not, not that I've done anything compared, compared to what you have, but I, I, very, uh, I was very fortunate when I ran the UK, I had two friends of mine that own companies that, they chuck 500 quid in the pot towards my expenses. Right. Yeah. But I've never really kind of gone out for the corporate thing or. Yeah. How do you find that? Um, it's really difficult. Uh, the sponsorship world, because. Um, you're obviously you want money, but if you want money, then you have to give something back in return for that. So when you're trying to do stuff purely. Um, sorry, my neighbor was trying to. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, uh, can I just quickly? He's yeah, just just tell him we'll be five more minutes and then we're we're, we're good, mate. Oh, he, he seems to have gone. He seems to have gone. Um, so yeah, um, the sponsorship is it is tricky because you obviously want it, but you have to give something back for it. Uh, I've been really lucky that I got back from my big adventure and I got approached by a company. Um, it was Land Rover mobile phone. So I started working with them and then they introduced me to the Cotswold Outdoor and then that relationship happened and then kind of doing other things, other relationships happened and that has kind of snowballed and I've just stuck very closely with the everything I do is uh, about passion, about authenticity and about being who I am. And I've just been really lucky to fall in with these companies through chance. 
uh, that we have managed to work together in a way that we're we're doing stuff that's mutually mutually beneficial. Um, and uh, all the time, I've never um, never done an adventure that I've been told to do. I've always done adventures that I wanted to do, um, and they support me in that. So. And it's one of these things. I know this is a bubble I'm in at the moment. I left work six and a half years ago. And since then, I've had all these beautiful things happen and things dropped into place and sponsors arriving at the right time and then opportunities opening. And I got to do some amazing stuff. I'm not stupid. It's not going to last forever. Um, I will have to get a, a normal job again and pay for things. Um, but I just made the con conscious decision that you know, from 35 to 45, best years of your life, you're in good physical shape, you understand life and yourself a bit better. Enjoy those 10 years of life and have the best time you can have. And then sort out the rest of time. Because the whole time I was running the Americas, I kept meeting people go, you won't have regrets. And they were all like, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. And if I, and I just, it's just sat with me and it's like, I will keep pushing this as long as I can. And maybe when I finally finish my book, someone might buy that and that will be, that'll add a few more pennies and I'll get to go and do something else. And, um, but I basically try and work as much to be able to get enough pennies in the jar to pay for the next adventure. And then hopefully on the back of that, there'll be a new thing. But with COVID and all this, we're entering hard times for everyone. So yes. Last thing, Jamie. Um, Iceland, what a place! Right, amazing. You ran across it. Is, did I get that I, right? I did run across it. Yeah, six hundred and twenty kilometers in twelve days. So my connection with Iceland is, I um, drove a nineteen sixty two, I think it was, army truck. Nice. from sweden to iceland obviously not across the the arctic sea <laughs> no but you would have taken the ferry into what the town on the east town east side yes i i i can't That's remember I the name. My run. not not reykjavik i think we went to the the other side yeah that's um, where i started my run and then i ran back to i started yeah. at that ferry port yeah, so there was, I think there was six of us. We basically expedition to Iceland in this vintage army truck, Volvo, Volvo army truck. And what an, just what an amazing experience just to be in Iceland. Yeah. Um, the, you did it, you did it right, not me. So I got there thinking Iceland, volcanoes and thermals and it's going to be waterfalls and it's going to be so beautiful and then i ran through the center which is absolutely nothing there it's just desolate nothingness um i think i saw one thermal the whole time i was in iceland um and i was like oh you're meant to go around the edge of the island so i'm gonna to have to go back and cycle around it i think yes um i mean off the top of my head there's there's amazing waterfalls. Yeah. There's, there's geysers like in the, um, like you see in Yellowstone Park in America, where you wait for six or seven minutes and then suddenly yeah. woof, this water just shoots out the ground. Uh, there's a, like a sulfuric volcanic landscape in places where there's just a bubbling hot spring here. With I, saw, I saw one of them. I saw one of them. Oh. Yeah. We, we got to a place where we just all jumped in this river and it was boiling, not not boiling, but it was yeah. at the end of it. I think it was a 70 K trek we did. We we all got in this river and it was just so warm. A natural spring, I suppose you call it or yeah. a hot, hot spring. Um, then there's just the ancient like. Seafaring stroke Viking culture that just permeates. I mean, one place we went to, it was the original Viking parliament where they, the tribes used to meet for their, you know, their annual talk or whatever. And um, that was quite incredible. And then there was the food. Did you eat any of their weird food over there? 
I didn't eat weird food, but I ate the, what is it, the happy wedding cake or something, the rhubarb, the rhubarb kind of crumble cake, which is just, oh, God, it's so, I, I asked my mother to make me some, and she just wrote back and said, I've looked at how much sugar is in that, and I'm not making it. <laughs> um, so, no, I didn't eat any weird foods when I was there. I ate delicious food, but no weird stuff. What did you eat? They've got something called Harkle. Harkle. Um, it's fermented shark. Oh, wow. Okay. And it, and it goes back to the ancient days. And I, I'm sure indigenous like Eskimo communities probably still do this, but you, you catch a shark. It's so full of um, like uric acid that you can't really eat it. Yeah. So you got to bury it underground for a year and basically let it rot or ferment rot. I don't, I, I'm not a chef. I don't know. But it's heralded as like one of their national dishes yeah. a, alongside, I think it's sheep's brains. So when I got I've had, there. I've had lamb's brains. I've had lamb's brains before. Yeah. When I got there, that's like all I want to do is eat these two. Di- that's just the way my mind works. I want, I yeah. want the full experience and i couldn't get anyone else on the expedition to try this food it wasn't particularly disgusting i mean it wasn't you know it's not... lamb's brains i just i got lamb's brains and then just spread them on a piece of bread like pate and ate yeah they, they, it, it was edible put it that way you know i mean yeah. it wasn't it wasn't disgusting or anything but um I, i've eaten a lamb's eyeball before that's not nice ah does that actually taste like eating an eye I was in Marrakesh with my girlfriend uh, at the time and we were, I, I was having one of those talks, oh, when you're in a country, you should eat like the local people do. And on the table next door to us were a whole bunch of Moroccans eating a sheep's head. So I went, right, start now. I'll have a sheep's head. <laughs> it came over to the table. <laughs> I watched them eating the eyeballs. So I got the eyeball out, put it in my mouth and like retched quite a lot. It was disgusting. It was more because you knew what you were eating. Um, mm. Jamie, what's next for you? What's your? What, what, I know things are a bit up up in the air at the minute, aren't they? But so I've got I've got one big adventure which is in the workings right now. I can't talk about what it is because of um, it hasn't been a hundred percent agreed and everything. But it's it's going to be a big adventure. Um, proper like multi-month thing uh which is something i really need to get back in and do because i haven't done that for a while um and then you know i i I want to do (sighs) cycle touring i'm really loving at the moment uh i really want to do some stuff in africa i've still got to go back and finish my run in madagascar which i never managed to do in 2019 because of ankle issues um you know, there's just this countless adventures, there. but also, you know, I'm getting to the point. I probably do need to create a sort of base, a sort of normality. Meet a girl, settle down, that kind of stuff. So I'm looking at that and then creating a bit of normality in life. But I don't think I'll ever stop adventuring. Well, I think when you get your book out and you, you, you could probably offer some sort of coaching in this area, I'm sure. Um, yeah, well, yeah. There's been a few a few options on that, but at the moment, I'm just you know focused on doing doing the adventures, and that's where I want to be. So, mm. yes. Is that where can people find you? I am. I'm principally on uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram, and Jamie is running is my handle, um, and I try and make videos, and I put them up and. Um, hopefully come the 15th of December, I'll be back up into the mountains doing some trekking, uh, camping up there, uh, love camping in the snow. So hopefully I'll be up there as soon as I'm allowed out of my house. So my gosh, is it that bad? I mean, I, I don't watch the news and I see stuff's going on. I, I just carry on normally, to be honest. So if I want to go for a run, I go for a run. But is, is, are you saying you're not actually allowed out? So in, no, in France, until Saturday, it changed on Saturday. But uh, before that, for a month before that, we weren't allowed to go more than one kilometre from our house. For, and we were only allowed to be out for one hour. And we had to have a piece of paper with our name, address, 
why we're out and what time we left our house every time we go out the house. This has now been extended to from one kilometer one hour to 20 kilometers three hours. So I can now go proper cycling, but uh, you kind of find a way around everything. Like you're not allowed to cycle, uh, do exercise for more than one kilometer. However, you're allowed to cycle to the supermarket. Um, so it's amazing how long a journey you can make it. Ten, like today my 10K cycle was 27 kilometers by the time I took every little long route I could possibly think. So you can get out there, you can do stuff. But It's amazing as human beings that we've lasted this millions of years we've been on the planet. We didn't, we didn't know all this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm the, the firmly Neanderth coming. The Neanderthals, the Neanderthals yeah. had to have a bit of paper to go out the cave and they weren't yeah. allowed <laughs> to meet more than eight um, people on a Wednesday. Yeah. Jamie, yeah. you've been absolutely brilliant. Thank you very um, much. But, well, um, it, it would be my dream one day to come and do, do some adventure with you. Even yeah. Big or small. Yeah, um, always. We'll I'm always off. doing something. Yeah, we'll we'll chuck our hawkers on and look like clowns. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I I tripped up on the curb yesterday because because they're so much bigger. The sole, I didn't lift my foot enough to jump on the curb. But like I normally, I think I've got used to using minimal energy when I run. Yeah. So I so I normally just like meet the curb like that. And of course, I got this big fat sole. I went ass over tit, cut all down my leg. Ah. Uh -uh. Two passers-by came to rescue me. Thank you so much if you ever get to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like a big dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you can still run this afternoon. Yes, but let's um, let, let's hook up at some time in the future. Yeah, definitely. That, that would be great. Definitely. Jamie, massive thank you. Um, Absolute pleasure. Stay on the line just so I can thank, thank you properly when I push off. Yeah, I know, will do. Button. To our friends at home, much love to you all. Please look after yourselves. I hope you got as much from this as, as I did. Um, what a wonderfully inspiring chat. And see you next time. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work, and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now, I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so, because you get one life, and if you live it right, one is enough.